Good evening, good evening, and welcome to another episode of The Unexpected Detour, where in life detours are inevitable. I am your host, Frances Hammond, and I have with me a special guest that I've known from the age of 18. Her name is Kimberly Marie Alicano. I've known her since she was 18. We work for the same company, and she was the only person that I would ever want to do my transactions for me. So then we had separated for a little while. She went her way. I still worked at the same bay, and then she came back. And actually, she came back to a place that I didn't know I was going to go to, which was another part of this building. Now, anyway, Kimberly, what is special about her? She had diabetes. She's had it since she was young. She had to have a kidney transplant. She's one year with her kidney. And then, unfortunately, she had her leg amputated. Not the whole thing, but part of it. But what is good about her is that nothing never stopped her. She is always been a hustler and she's never given up. So without any further ado, I'm going to let Kim tell you her story about her journey with her diabetes. Kim, take it over. Good evening, Francis. First, I would like to say thank you for having me on your podcast. It's a pleasure. And it's been a pleasure knowing you since I'm 18 years old. You're just like family now. So I'll go on to say that I had diabetes and was diagnosed since I was age 25. And I also have hypertension. As life went on, my diabetes and my hypertension affected my kidney, which led me to kidney failure, as they would say, renal failure. I started swelling where I couldn't even sit in these shoes. And I was told that I would need dialysis because my creatinine levels had reached a five. And I had a lot of toxics in my body. And I could have possibly died if I didn't start dialysis to clean myself out. So I did dialysis for seven and a half years. It's not easy. Nothing is easy in life. However, I looked at it as if God opened my eyes every day. I was going to push to survive and to enjoy life. And yes, I am a hard worker. So a lot of people are very shocked that I work through being on a machine. It was three days out of the week. And it was three and a half to four hours each day. It took a lot out of life. However, it brought me to a kidney transplant last year, March 20th of 2023. I got a call at 5 a.m. And when I went in, it was a 38-year-old who just had head trauma, but it was a great kidney. He had no diabetes, no hypertension, nothing. So here I am today. My anniversary is March 20th, 2024. It will be one year. My kidney is doing well. I'm doing well. And as Francis stated, regretfully, with the diabetes, I've also encountered 12 surgeries to try to save my foot, my left foot. I had osteomyelitis, which is caused by diabetes. And when your diabetes is uncontrolled, uh, regretfully, it starts messing with your organs. So first it was the kidney, and then it was my foot. After the 12 surgeries, I was getting very, very tired. However, one day I was in the house and really did not feel myself, did not feel good at all. And I deal with all of the hospitals in Manhattan, well, Cornell, for example, that's one of them. And that's the one I honestly stay with at this point. And when I went to the kidney transplant clinic, I told them I was not feeling well. So I didn't know what it was because I had so much going on. It was in my brain to say that I hope nothing is going on with the kidney. And so when they rushed me for all types of exams in the ER, 
it came out that I had septic. I was very, very lethargic, fever, out of it. Really wasn't responsive for at least two days. And when the doctors surrounded me, I looked up and it was maybe about 15 to 20 doctors standing. And they said, this is serious. Septus could kill you. We're going to test your blood to make sure it didn't touch your blood. Regressively, septus was in my blood. But I always say there is a God. And I still stay strong, laying in the hospital bed. I was still praying that he would get me. And when the doctor came to me, when I got sent to the transplant floor, because no matter what's going on with you in Cornell, if you're a kid transplant survivor, they send you to that floor to make sure that the kidney is not being in any type of danger or whatever is going on with you otherwise. So when it came to my bedside, they said, we don't have an alternating have septus and your foot has to come off. You have to have a below the knee. And at that day, that, day, that particular day, I did company. I was just laying there, like looking up in the, in the air, just like talking to God, like how's my life going to be without a limb? And I cried, I cried, you know, of course, like, this was, like, the worst thing of my life that I have ever, ever experienced, and I've been through some things health-wise, and I said, you know what, God has never failed me, anything I prayed to him about, he always answered my prayers, and I'm sure the doctor is not leading me in the direction. So the next day when my cousin Sal came up to the hospital, uh, the doctor came back and he said, see, your foot is black. We went inside to try to debris it to see if we can work with it, but it's totally black, the septic to your, to your mid-calf. So I said, well, I don't want it to travel any further. He said, but what we have to do is put you on several antibiotics and an infectious disease doctor because I have to try to get the septus out of your bloodstream. My kidney function was kind of like all over the place. So the kidney transplant team, they were coming in trying to save my kidney. And thank God, eventually my creatinine level went down from three point something down back down to one. If your creatinine level is high or they go higher up to a Five, that means your kidney is not working. Kim, oh. your phone, the volume. Where's your phone? Here. Oh, because the volume is going up and down. Uh, interrupting. Yeah. I turned it up. Can you hear me better? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hold on. We freezing up here. Hold on, Kim. Can you hear me better? Yeah, now I can hear you. Much better, much better. Okay. So in a, to make a long story short, I had an amputation below the knee and they wound up getting septus out of my body, out of my bloodstream, using several different antibiotics. And I applied for Baker 17, which was an acute rehab in Well Cornell, upstairs from where I was at. And you had to apply because it was something that you couldn't be lazy about. You had to get up every day, early in the morning, work out in the gym. Then you had to work out again in the afternoon. It was my version of boot camp. But uh, they actually put you in bed at 9 o'clock. It's like you have to get rest and then back in the morning, give you breakfast and let's go. You have to work out. And they basically show you how to move around to maneuver without my foot being an amputee. So now I'm a permanent amputee. I'm a kidney transplant survivor. And now at this point, I was fitted for a prosthetic, which is going to be temporary. 
you making you making mm -hmm. strides. Look at that. Yes, and I have the best therapist who comes to my home and helps me. Um, I also have a great support system. My friends, my coworkers, my family, my cousins, you know, and my cousins are like my sisters. And my mom never had any children other than me, but we were raised together. We hung out together. We vacationed together. We do a lot together. And uh, I also, you know, met a young man who I've been in a relationship with for almost two years now. And he's definitely supportive as well. You know, he's my calm to my storm. <laughs> but um, other than that, I'm just looking forward to receiving my prosthetic the end of February or the beginning of March. So my message to anybody is that all sickness is not death because I've actually kissed the door of death twice and God wasn't ready for me yet. So you have to push. If he sees that you're pushing and you're fighting for life or to live life, then he will work with you and he will give you what you're wishing for. And I love life. I love to work through all my journey. I've worked. And I thank God for the job that I have because they're very understanding as well. And um, all I can say to anyone is that diabetes is nothing to play with. If you're borderline or if you're told that you're borderline, then you should try to take control of it before it takes control of you. And when you're young, sometimes you don't pay attention to your health. And I think that's where I fell in. I always worked two and three jobs and, you know, I grabbed something to eat here, grabbed something to eat there. Uh, oh, let me drink a Pepsi. That's going to keep me up. That's going to keep me going. No, it's not. It's actually going to break down your body. The best form of eating is to eat at home. And yes, you can enjoy going to restaurants on the weekend. But as my dietitian said, it's all about making the right choices off of the menu. You know, your girlfriend can have fried chicken, macaroni and cheese, mashed potatoes and a potato salad. But you can have a piece of salmon, maybe a vegetables and a salad. So it's all about the choices that you make and exercising every day. And exercising doesn't mean you have to join anyone's gym. It's simply you can walk around the block four or five times, you know, or you could do some exercises in your house just to keep yourself going and not falling into, you know, being diabetic and, your, you know, it starts affecting your organs, your heart, your liver, your kidney, everything. But so, you've had diabetes for a long time. You've had yeah, that, since you were a young person. I've had diabetes. I was diagnosed with it when I was 25. I was working in a beauty salon at that point and um, I passed out. And once they got me to the hospital, my sugar was 800. Oh. So it knocked my pancreas right out. My pancreas doesn't produce insulin at all. So I will always be on insulin for the rest of my life. Oh. Um, they, they offered to go on the pancreas transplant list and wait for both a kidney and a transplant. But with both of those surgeries, I would have been down for about a year. It takes about a year to heal. Oh, okay. you know? And um, I, I, I'm also, I also live alone. So, you know, a lot of things that I make conscious decisions about is making them with knowing that I live alone like I said, I have a good support system, but I don't want to put my whole life on someone's plate, right. you know? So I also think for myself when I have to make these decisions, okay, you live alone, you being down for a while, you know, you wouldn't be able to do a lot. Right. So Let me ask you something, because I know people with diabetes and they always craving something like sweet or something. Is that part of it too that you have okay. this craving for like sugary things it's like it can't be helped it's like you have to have it is that yes 
Yes, you do crave for for sugar. And however, I buy a lot of sugar free things, especially like now. Um, there's Russell Stover's uh, candy, but it's sugar free. It doesn't taste the same. And honestly, I don't indulge in it much. It's only like a treat once in a blue moon, only because they say sugar free, but it still has like a sugar alcohol in it, you know, or it has something in it, aspartame, something to make it sweet, whereas I believe it can affect your diabetes as well. So to me, it's just like you can indulge like here and there. The worst thing for diabetes is soda. I'm happy that I came away from soda a lot because I was a big soda drinker. And when I say a big soda drinker, I would drink about six Pepsis a day. I would move from Pepsi and now I said, oh, well, that's bad because it's dark soda. Let me move to ginger ale's. All of those sodas have over 70 grams of sugar in it, plus added sugars. So, yeah. yeah. That wasn't any good, no. No. What about your, uh, your your eating? Because I know I know a lady, she eats like a spoonful of rice. She's diabetic. That's it. She won't well, I moved my rice. Oh. I moved my rice over to basmati rice because basmati rice has no sugar in it. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But I still only eat one spoon of it. Okay. Like you know, I I as the dietitian tells us when you know when she taught me in the hospital, like they would give me whatever I wanted to eat in the hospital, but most of my plate consists of vegetables. Okay. So they give you like maybe four ounces of meat, vegetables, and then in the hospital, they use an ice cream scooper to basically like give you that amount of starch. Because oh, they tell okay. you don't. So, don't, so it's yeah. a portion control, really. You it's portion control. control. Your portions. Yes. I think and everybody it, should learn how to eat like that portion control. Don't overconsume mm -hmm. anything. Just exactly. keep a certain portion to maintain your weight and your health and mm -hmm. yeah that, that that's starches, important starches have a big thing with it as well like you know like potato they tell you instead of white potato choose baked yam or you know something at you know a little bit more better because white bread white everything white breaks down into sugars right. you know and it raises your sugar as well pasta you know, I just started buying gluten-free pasta. Yeah, because I looked up pasta and I said, I want to do this pasta thing. You say, eat whole wheat pasta. Don't eat the white one, the whole wheat one. So, because pasta is good for you because it burns the calorie. It'll burn off, too. Right, right. And I can't overindulge. So. Right, right. Yeah. You have to know everything. Everything you do has to just be in moderation. right. You know, drink a lot of water. You know, water is great for the kidney. You know, it's great Flushes. to flush out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what they want to do after your kidney, did you want the pancreas taken care of? They have to look for one of those too then, huh? Well, I can always go on the list to get a pancreas. If I get a pancreas, then I won't have to take insulin the rest of my life. I was so used to sticking myself, you know, that, I just said, listen, the kidney is what I want right now because the machine, I just, nobody knew. Like, everybody always said to me, you look so good. Oh, you do that so well. And I always believed it never looked like what you're going through. But that machine is terrible. It's, I mean, flushes, you know, it's flushing out blood, right? I remember yeah. when you got the stick in your arm. And then so you basically, I still have it. It's connected oh, you do? to the heart. Yes, oh, because they won't, they won't. Yeah, they won't remove it. Oh, even so I always not, wondered. Even though you have a new kidney, they're gonna leave it there. Yeah, because oh. your kidney, like my kidney, I have now. They said that as long as it's taken care of, and I'm on the medication for the rest of my life, it's an anti-immune suppressant, so that the kidney doesn't reject my body. So I'll be on that for the rest of my life. Um. But God forbid I ever had to go back on dialysis. Oh, so they just you leave know. it there. Yeah, they leave it there. Yeah, it was interesting when I asked you about how to do the surgery. And I thought they took out the other kidney. And Kimberly was like, uh-uh. They stick yeah. it right there. 
It stays oh. right there. So it's actually in your esophagus. It's in the front of my stomach and mm. it's attached to my urethra. Oh. So I have staples going straight down my stomach. It was okay. very uncomfortable, but you know, I'm doing much better now. The staples is out. My, my cut is healed, you know, so. But yeah, they don't no, take them out no more. I, I thought they took it out and they just uh put another one in place. <laughs> I had no idea until you told me that right. you have so actually you have a dead kidney and two kidneys. I have yes, I have a deceased person's kidney and then I have two bad kidneys that just don't work. And oh, never so work. they don't take anything out, they just leave it in your body. They just leave oh. it it's different. Is different and and having a kidney transplant is definitely a plus because you don't have to be on that machine anymore. But you have to prepare yourself right. financially, mentally, and physically because and spiritually too. the medications that we take. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, once you're on dialysis, you get forced. You're. Where can we do it? Currently on Medicare, but I've always kept. The job insurance too right. so i think for united healthcare as well because this is you know things are so expensive i but i let them pick up the 20 percent, but my co-payments are still expensive yeah um, tell me i know yeah. about the co-pays yeah right so my co-payment for all of my kidney medication every month is like 500 dollars. wow so the and medicare then, will uh do that when when it's no, time to get actually, a kidney I, actually what? i pay for that Oh, okay. Because my Med Medicare and United Healthcare, they pay for the the the, the pill itself. Like one of my oh. pills is twelve hundred dollars a month. Oh, okay. Just one of them is like wow. twelve hundred. So if I didn't have coverage, just imagine that. No, I, I don't want to imagine it. When you went through the pro, <laughs> no, I don't want. I already paid for one. When you went through your process to get the kidney, you had to find a match, correct? How, they how to, yes, they have to find a match. So you you go in every year, because I'm sure you remember that I had to always take yeah. off the time to go in. You go in every year, once a year, and update everything. They check you from head to toe. So they want your podiatrist to check your feet. That's what had put me inactive for a while. But then when my foot was healing and I thought I was doing better, that's when the podiatrist said, we're going to heavy up and get you back on that list fast because why your foot is okay. You need to get your kidney. I said, okay. And sure enough, I got my kidney. And then, you know. I remember when you got the kidney. When you yeah. called me, you was like, oh, friend, I got to go to the hospital. They got my kidney. It was yeah. five o'clock in the morning and I knew you was like the earliest supervisor that's, <laughs> up, that's up, you know? Yeah. So I thought I, I got to call her. It was like six in the morning. I'm like, I'm, let me call her right now in case they take me right in. Yeah, I was all excited. I went there to her, told Vito, I was like, you got a kidney. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what you were praying for. You were definitely praying for that kidney. And I sure was, because I was getting tired. I was just getting so tired of the machine. And now, you know, I stay in touch with the people that's still on the machine. And I just try to encourage them to get on the list and things like that. Because if you have other things going on with you, they won't put you on the list. Oh, okay. um, but before all of this foot and action and everything going on, um, I was a strong believer in like my vitamins, D, E, C, my multivitamins. And like I said, I held two jobs down and dialysis, you know, and I was just keeping myself active and taking care of myself, getting my rest and things like that. Um, but at the time, some people that's in dialysis, they either have like heart troubles. They might, um, they so might need to have some room. other medical condition. You can't get on the list. No, they won't even approve you. It's like applying oh. for a job. You got to be qualified really? for a transplant. They want to know that you're going to take care of that transplant. Oh, God you know? worked it out for you that you yeah. got that kidney before that foot thing. Right. Right. And they call your center where you do dialysis and they ask them, does Kimberly come to dialysis on a regular? Does she oh. cut her time? Does she cut her time on the machine? They ask all of that because they feel like if you're not taking care of yourself in dialysis, why waste an organ when so many people are waiting? Oh, they be checking on you then, huh? 
They are very strict. It's nothing to be played with. They check you. You have to bring your gynecologist clearance, your dental. You can't have moving teeth. You can't have gum disease. Like you can't have oh. nothing going on with you. Vision. I had to go to each of these doctors. Not that I don't do it anyway. So I was always in good shape, you know, with, with all, cause I had, I always followed up with all of my doctors once a year to get, you know, things checked out and make sure mammogram is done and everything. So or I, you had to get a letter every year from each specialist and bring it into them, showing that you cleared. And you also had to do a stress test. Oh, because I know you were going for those stress tests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. I remember. You, you, yep. Oh, so that's why you got to, you really got to go to that dialysis then. Yes, yes. You can't you be have playing to. games. You can't be like, oh, mm -hmm. I can't go. Oh. And yeah. dialysis. I'm not going to say it, it It affects the people in different ways. With mm -hmm. me, I couldn't stand the vomiting. Oh. Every time I got off the machine and nobody knew, I never like complained or, you know, uh -huh. I just did what I had to do. So I would come home, get myself together. Uh, and I will always be nauseous when I get off the machine. Oh. But some people throw up right there in the center. I used to get home and... Mind you, I would drive myself there and drive myself never. back because a Cessa ride is a, a monster. That's stress a ride. That's not yeah, a Cessa. It was like, I ain't waiting for them, my friend. I'm driving myself. No, exactly. Because that would get home at 12 midnight and then had to drive to Austin to work. I know. Like, I it was lie. just too much. Yeah. So I had to say, say to myself, listen, if I drive myself, then I can get right in the car. And I don't know if it was the motion of the car coming off the machine or what, but I would walk right in the house and go straight in the bathroom. Yeah. So that was my worst part of being on the machine. Other than that, as long as you go to your treatments, and this is for anybody that's on dialysis, you go to your treatments, get cleaned out, you're going to feel good. You know, you'll you feel better good. after. Yeah, I felt better because I was cleaned out. You have to make sure you eat well you know, drink water, but you're, you're limited to your drinks as well. It's 32 ounces a day because you can't wow. get, like, yeah, I learned, I learned my lesson one time. I drank too much, not alcohol, but I just drank a lot of fluids. I was really hot in the summertime and I was drinking, drinking, drinking for God. I was on dialysis and Lord, I could not breathe. My no. lungs had filled up the fluid. Uh -huh. Yep. My heart rushed me to the hospital and they put a bypass on my face. I don't know if you remember, I couldn't breathe that bypass. They said, we're going to see if this helps her. If not, we're going to have to intubate her. I remember. Well, it was, that was good. That thing worked for me. It was pushing oxygen down oh. my lungs. And they gave me two treatments of emergency dialysis. And then I was better. After that, I would drink a small glass of water in the morning, my coffee, maybe another little glass of water at lunch. And then at nighttime, I would probably have like maybe a juice or something like that. But well, that dialysis is real serious stuff. It is. It yeah, is. So I've seen so many people pass away in in the seven and a half years I was in that center. Uh -huh. I've seen so many people pass away. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. That that that's something. You you've been through a lot. I gotta say that. And mm -hmm. you have been through that, the rehab center, when you yeah. got the other foot taken care of. And yeah, when the other foot had an infection, I was in rehab. I lived there for seven weeks. Until so they started asking me for my pay stuff. I said, listen, <laughs> I have I have a home where I have to pay rent. I said, I think I can go home. Yeah. And, you know, the, 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 the rehab was okay, but their food is well, their food just is not good. It was not oh. good. This rehab that I was in for my amputee, their food was good. I just learned that I live in Brooklyn, but I do not like any of the Brooklyn hospitals. Okay. So I would rather travel to Manhattan. And if you call an ambulance, they're not going to take you to Manhattan. They're going to take you they're to the take you to Brooklyn. Right. So yeah, they're not going to take you where you want to go. They're going to take exactly. you to the nearest hospitalist. And then they don't have your hospital records. So it's a waste. Yes. 
So you just yeah. go where you go. Well, I gotta say, I mean, you've been doing pretty good out there driving and stuff. <laughs> yeah. You driving yeah. with that? You've been driving now? Actually, I just, yeah, I just started um, practicing uh, yeah, the driving. How, how's that going? But, it's going pretty well. It's going pretty well because I never, you know, my driving foot is my good leg. Right. So the doctor gave me permission to drive as long as I have someone in the car with me. Oh, okay. So because whatever equipment I'm using, like if I'm using my wheelchair or my knee scooter. Oh, yeah, you have to have somebody with you so they can help you to yeah. get out. Exactly. So, so they can you put get it your, in and out when of you the get car. your prosthetic leg, you won't have to have anybody with you, right? No, I have to do therapy though, um, because they have to teach you how to balance and how to walk with it. Um, I talk a lot to my girlfriend Naima because she I was gonna say amputee. Naima is like that, right? Yes. She had an amputee since she was fourteen years old. You know, oh. she was, mm -hmm, so I asked her a lot of questions and things like that. But um I probably will be on a walker when I first get my leg. Mm -hmm. Because I, you know, I have to learn how to balance, how to walk again, you know. Right. And um, then he said, usually from the walker, you might move to the cane, just so you have balance and you're comfortable. Right. And then it's just like little... you're, walking, you're learning how to walk all over again. Yeah, and that's what it is because you're used to those two legs, and I'm sure you have those phantom symptoms that there's a leg there, right? Oh my God. So let's talk about that. <laughs> the phantom pain I endure during the night sometimes. I don't even, I, sometimes I don't even complain to my cousins. I'm, you know, we'd be talking on the phone and stuff. I don't even tell them because I just be like, it's so regular now. You know, they'd be like, do you still, yes, I still feel it. But, you know, I just ignore it. They have me on gabapentin three times a day. Um, it does help. But at nighttime, I think when I go to lay and relax my nub, it's like I'll feel like my toe is hurting or my ankle. And then I have to jump up if I'm sleeping because I'm like, I know you got no leg there. But they tell you when you get up to go to the bathroom or anything, just sit up on the side of the bed so you can get your composure and remember that you don't have a leg because that's how they got oh, some people Oh, because then you'll hospital. jump up. And you jump up floor. and you'll be you'll hit the floor. Right. And you don't want to hit the nub. Oh no. You don't want to do oh. that. Oh, so you do have those pains. Because when you told me that was happening, I was looked it up and I was like, Kim is gonna have those phantom pains. Like mm -hmm. like this leg is still there. Like the foot is still there. And they said it's because the nerve is actually still at the bottom of your nub. So that's oh. when you feel that. And Naima, believe it or not, she's 45 as well. We're the same age. And as I said, she had her since she's 14. So if you do the math, 31 years, and she said she still feels phantom pain. Really? They said it's something that never goes away as long as your nerve is alive. Oh, you know? so that's why the people... They still feel like there's something attached there, and it's not. Yes. Oh, yes. that's interesting, Kim. It's not like a tingling feeling. You know, it feels like your ankle is there, or it feels like your toe. I was going to say, like your toes are there, right? Mm hmm. Wow. But it's not something that stays like for hours and you no, know. No, it just, it just, it's, it's it just, just really mm -hmm. happens. Like when you got to go to that bathroom, I'm sure. Yes. Yes. Oh, because I knew somebody that used to go to church with my mother, and he had the leg. His was from the arm, the war. So okay. It was his leg, and he would always um say that his leg was hurting, but he had no, <laughs> but his leg right. wasn't there. He had, his was like yours. It was that partial part of the leg. Right. But they say that, that, you know, not to say that it's great to be an amputee, but they said that. Being an amputee, the best thing about it, about my surgery is that I have my knee still. Yeah, and that's how I see most of the people. They have the knee. Mm -hmm. So they just lost that the lower part. So right. Naima, the same thing, right? Yes. She's a below-the-knee amputation. Oh, mm -hmm. so she's been a big help to you then. Yeah, talking to her, can, she definitely has. talk to her about, you know, 
I'm sure. And there's a guy named Brandon on Instagram, and I don't even know him, but someone said to me, they sent me a text. They said, Kim, you're so inspiring. You're going to be just like this guy. And he was just dancing to this song with his prosthetic on. Yeah, I you thought know. about you because I said, Kim, we do have to do the, uh, what's that, um, the wobble? I saw <laughs> all of them dances from Kim watching Puck at work when we would work on Saturdays. Remember? Right. You know, I love how to, to dance. I love listening to music. And I still do the same um things, you know. And I, like I said, I just try not to complain because the things that I have been through, I'm just so humble now, relaxed. I appreciate my peace and quietness. And, you know, I just thank God. Like, he really, really has yeah, showed us. He brought you to a me. mighty long way. Yes, he has. A mighty long way. That's and I just want to say, too, that I, I appreciate your friendship. Okay. I really do because no matter what I go through, no matter how we fuss at work, mm -hmm. I'll call and always, check on you. You always yeah. call and check. Yes, you do. That yeah. I give you. And I tell anybody, like, life is hard for everyone. And we all go through the same things at different times, different challenges. Like, we go through death. We go through sickness. But it just hits us at different times. And I'm an understanding person. I understand that people have their own life. I understand people have their own things they're going through. But if you pick up the phone and just take two seconds and say, hi, Kim, how you doing? Or shoot me a text. That means so much to me. Yeah. It means so much to me because I'm not a bothering person. If I ask you for something or to do something for me, I must really need it. Yeah, well, look, Kim, you came up to the Bronx to see me, remember? <laughs> yes, I did. Yes, I when did. When I was in the hospital, I was like, here she come. She made sure mm -hmm. I got some food that day, too. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, y'all yeah. got to feed her. I was like, yeah. So mm -hmm. I said, I know we get on each other's nerves, but it's all good. Right, and, I, and I, it's not even a matter of getting on each other's nerves. It's just that everybody's going to have different opinions. And sometimes, and you know, some you're gonna have like how you how you feel about a situation, how I feel about a situation. But the good thing is that when you can have a disagreement, talk about it and put it past you and go on. Right. That's that's a level of maturity. Yeah, a lot of maturity. Yeah, and it is. It you know, takes because a lot it's to move forward and just let sleeping dogs lie. Exactly. Exactly. It shouldn't be, oh, we had a disagreement. I didn't like what you said, or, you know, I'm not going to talk to you no more. Yeah. It doesn't, no, for what? That's what you know? I said. I said, Kim, she has been through it all, man. Mm -hmm. And you know, because you've been right there with me. Like you said, you know me since I'm 18 when I started the bank as a teller. Yeah, okay. buddy. And I used to, mm -hmm. I was over there at the federal court. I was like, Kim, cash my <laughs> check. <laughs> yep, exactly. So Miss Malachi was like, or oh, ask for Kim. And I, I could tell this. She said, Kim Palacano. So I said, Well, Palacano, that's an Italian name. I yeah. come up there and I'm like, Well, I'm looking for Kim Palacano. Everybody, everybody, when I walk in a room for interviews or something, I think they're just looking for this full Caucasian woman. Yeah. And then they get then they like uh Kimberly Policano. And I'm like, yeah. Hi. And then when you <laughs> said you said I, I asked Sean. I said, Sean, where's Kimberly Policano? She said, that's Kim. I said, that's Kimberly Policano. I said, oh, she's black. <laughs> yeah. Because Miss Malachi never told me what you look like. She just told me who to ask for. Right. Like, you yeah, right. know. I said, you had me fooled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny though. I was looking for this white girl. I came in there. I said she's Italian. That's why I asked Sean. Mm -hmm. so like, yeah, yes, Kim. Oh, right? Sean, Sean was Italian. Yeah, yeah. That's who. Mm -hmm. No, Sean was Irish, really. She was Irish. Okay. Yeah, her husband was Italian. I Demarco was. Oh, okay. That's why then, because I was yeah. about to say Demarco sound. Yeah, Italian. her husband was Italian. She was Irish. Yes. So, okay. Kim, could you give the people any advice about how to care for themselves and 
what was your main focus of how you cared for yourself? What kept you really going? I know, my main, this, but you focus, tell people. My main focus for caring for myself is never letting myself go, meaning I continue to get my hair done, to care for my skin, to care for my body. I started changing the ways I eat because my the, my eating habits was terrible. And I always did things to pamper me. Never wait for someone to love you or take you out. I, I can do those things myself. Right. Like, you know, I feel like you have to love you before you can love anyone else or expect anyone to love you. So when you're going through what you're going through, never look like what you're going through. Right. You know, even in a wheelchair, I still dress up. She sure did know? add up braids and everything. I was like, okay. Yeah. It was a point I couldn't even get into most of these salons because they had stairs. And I found the young lady who would come to my house. I paid for her Uber. I mean, if you have money, you can basically pay for anything. Right, right. <laughs> Not tell anybody. Yeah. Exactly. Go so come. I would get my hands in right here in my house. Yeah. And then when I was able to get out, um, my cousins would take me to get my nails done, my feet done. That's one thing. They don't leave me out of anything, I must say. Um, my 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 cousins and I have been hanging out since we were kids and now, even though I have a disability, um, I respect them as well because they will put me in the wheelchair. Hey, we're going to King's Plaza. Come on. They'll put me on a bus. You know, they'll push me through the mall, take me to the concerts. They're taking me to see Keisha Cole on March 10th. Okay. You know, they're like, if you don't have your leg, girl, that's all right. We're going to take you right in a wheelchair. Yeah. And they, you got your foot, when your foot was messed up, they took you then too. Yes. Yeah. It wasn't letting no grass grow under your feet. And that's exactly, why. and exactly. then so you prayed, and that's why I said sometimes you know, action speaks louder than words. You know, a person can tell me all day long that they love me, but show me, yeah, show me why I'm living, give me my flowers while I'm living, don't show me why I'm dead. No, nah, no, nobody wants um, you, ain't gonna be able to smell them then, so. Exactly, exactly. So just self-care means a lot. And I know you can say the same thing because yeah. you'll, you'll go sit down and have dinner by yourself. You'll go to the mall by yourself. I sure you will. Know. You always, nobody to swing with. I know how to do it. Yes. Your, your makeup always looks nice. You always look presentable, your clothes, you know, and I think that makes you feel better too. Yes. You know, it makes you feel better about you yourself. you take care of yourself, you always feel better. Exactly. No what you're going through, you just smile. Yeah. And never wait to go to a doctor and check on yourself. You know, never say, oh, okay, I'm going to diagnose this myself. Oh, I've been having chest pains. Oh, it's probably gas. Let me take ginger ale. Let me take, listen, it may be gas, but go check it out to make sure that right. it's gas because you're not a doctor. No, you know, no. you might feel like it's gas, but it could be something else. So I learned that because I stay on top of my health, a lot of my issues too got caught just in time. Right, because your body, your body tells you when things are going wrong. Yes, yes, it will tell your you when you're not feeling you. good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. and I, I've also had COVID too. I almost died with COVID. Oh yeah, I forgot you had that too, Kim. I had COVID when it first came out, like when nobody knew what it was. Remember, we was working from home. Yeah. And I, I was sick as a dog in here and I kept looking at the news. It kept saying people were going on respirators and they was dying. And I said, I'm not going to the hospital to die. I'm going to stay here and take care of myself. But let me tell you, it was a struggle to even walk to my car to go to dialysis. You hear what I tell you? It was a struggle. I couldn't breathe. I had all the symptoms, the weakness. I lost 18 pounds in two weeks. But you I tell you the dialysis. Yes, I had to get to dialysis. And they had a separate section for the COVID people. They treated us like we were just, you know, they isolated us or whatever the case may have been. And i never forget, Frida went to the pharmacist crying and saying my cousin sound like she's gonna die she's not eating what can i give her and they told her to buy me Tylenol mm -hmm. 
uh, Tylenol cold, severe flu and cold. And she put it uh, on my door. And I started taking that. That's when the fevers went away. The COVID started getting better or what have you. And she started Uber eating me food. You got to eat. You got to eat or you're going to die. And I started eating little by little. The little food she sent me, it took me like four days to eat off of it, little by little. Praise to God, you ate it through. Little. Yeah, I didn't know what it was. And then they, they came out talking about it was. Kim, I'm mute too. Okay. Okay. All right, you back? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if if would you like to be an advocate for the kidney or you know to go and speak to other people about this? You ever thought about that? Yes, I have. I have thought about it. Um, Tasha that we work with, mm -hmm. uh, she's. Uh, I stay in touch with her. She's uh, very sweet as well. I'm going to talk to her about uh, YouTubing as well. Because I do I do little clips like on social media, you know, just to encourage people, you, you know. And This is all you do. You just get your, uh, your phone, take a video, put mm -hmm. it up there, and that's it. And then watch it grow. Yes. Yes. And I, and I do, I would like to be an advocate because sometimes people look at it is, oh, she's telling all her business on social media. No, I'm not telling all my business. I'm trying to encourage people that can be going through what I went through or that could avoid, you know, being, uh, 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 getting an organ or an amputee who, who could avoid these things by just taking charge of their health sooner because diabetes sometimes don't just just hit you sometimes it starts with oh okay your sugars are a little high or you're pre-diabetic we're going to start you on a pill or you know where you can actually work on it before it gets full blown right you yes. know so yeah. i don't look at it as selling my business i look at it as trying to encourage people and inspire them and if they have any questions I don't mind answering them. So if they had a question, how could they contact you? Through your email? They can contact me through my email. Okay. They can contact me through inboxing me on social media. Okay. On um you want rather Facebook or um what's the other one? Instagram. Instagram. It doesn't matter. Oh. I, I usually send both messages now because a lot of people, you know, uh inboxes me to check on me, just to say, you know, are you okay? Right. Do you need anything? You know, now only our friend call you at seven o'clock in the morning. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. And Weg and Wegman. I don't hear from her. I'll be on the phone seven o'clock in the morning. Kim, you all right? <laughs> you sure do. You sure do. You be like it's seven o'clock, Aunt Friend. I am asleep. Okay, I just gotta make sure. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, you don't forget the people that were good to you. Yeah. Right. That's why right. I said, despite differences, you were there. You always check on me too, so I gotta give it yeah. to you, and vice yeah. versa. Yes, you know. But anyway, Kim, we are going to end this, and okay. I thank you for sharing your story, your unexpected detour, because it was definitely unexpected, except yes. for the kidney. Well, the kidney kind of was unexpected because you never thought it would go that far. Not the dialysis. Both kidneys no. would shut down on you. Yeah. Right. At 37, I just thought they were going to give me a pill to help me. Right. And then, <laughs> and then I'm thankful that you got the kidney before the foot got messed up. Because yes. otherwise, you would have still been on that dialysis. I would have. Yes. And You're so, absolutely right. So God worked it out where he made sure you got that kidney before that mm -hmm. leg was gone. Yeah. And I'm thankful for it because now you can do, you can be Kim again. <laughs> Living your yes. life like it's golden. Yes. Tell you, you have to live while you're here, you know? Yes, because you so. do live life like it's golden. I be hating sometimes. I said, this should be all over the place, but hey. I'm happy you know, for you. Yeah, I try. You know, I yeah, try to. That, that's why I said you don't let grass grow under your feet. Mm -mm. <laughs> no, can be on the go, on the go. Mm -hmm. She finds things to keep herself busy. Yes, and that's mm -hmm. a good thing. But anyway, yeah. Kim, 
I'm going to go and I thank you. And you can come back again when you start getting all these calls. Okay. And tell us about how you have been able to help other people who have who are on dialysis or who mm -hmm. have diabetes. So you can you can give them information before they end up on dialysis. What needs to be done to keep yourself from getting that far? Right. Because I know that some people, they can control that diabetes. Yes, it can be controlled. It's all about, uh, my doctor used to have a saying, he said, you are what you eat. Yeah. Yeah. And whatever so. you're eating, you know, it attributes to your health. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess that's with anything, you know, you just have to be careful of what you eat and how you take care of yourself. Yes. So That's we're going to end this. And, okay. It was okay. a pleasure speaking with you. Oh, thank you, Kimberly. Mm -hmm. I love you. <laughs> I love you as well. Okay.